When you build a Cobra replica, or basically build any project car, one of the toughest decisions you have to make is what engine do I put in the car? And with the Cobra, it's even compounded a little further because you're sort of building the car from scratch and there's a ton of unknowns. So that said, as you get into your build, you're probably gonna make some mistakes. Um, well, you are gonna make mistakes. I made tons of mistakes when I was building this car. And thankfully I was able to fix most of them. Picking the wrong motor though, uh, that's one mistake that is hard to fix. And that's because the motor typically goes in early in the build. And in a lot of ways you end up configuring the car around the engine you're selecting. So today I'm going to walk you through how you should approach picking an engine for this car. And bear in mind, you know, these are guidelines only. Uh, there's not a one size fits all approach towards building one of these cars. Um, certain people are going to want a certain configuration and that's just fine. Uh, so take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt as you approach picking an engine for your car. Let's start things off by talking about the power requirements that this car needs. So, um, it's a sports car, goes without saying. Um, and if we just do a quick calculation here, I actually just Googled uh, C8 Corvette. So that's definitely one of the fastest launching, you know, hard to accelerate in sports cars you can buy out there right now. And it's 0.14 horsepower per pound. Now the Cobra weighs right around 2,200 pounds, maybe up to 2,500, but I'm going to use 2,200 because I think that's what's advertised uh, quite a bit. And a 300 horsepower motor gives you almost the same horsepower ratio. I actually calculated 0.136 horsepower per pound. So it gives you an idea that uh, you don't need insane power with this car. Now 300 horsepower isn't a magic number either. So you know I know I've maybe advertised in past years I have 300 horsepower go for 400 you go for 450 but just bear in mind that this car is already fairly unsafe in a relatively low power form because of this power to weight ratio and, and the more horsepower you put behind the wheels of this thing uh, the more dangerous it can be and, and difficult to control if, if you put the pedal down and you don't know what you're doing Okay, now that we got requirements out of the way, uh, there's really two paths that you can take when picking an engine for this car. And the first path is definitely the simplest path. Uh, it's the most reliable path, but it's also the path that's going to cost you the most money. And that's to pick a crate engine uh, for your build. Probably the most popular crate motor uh, we're getting put into Cobras right now, the Factory 5 Cobra is the 5 liter Coyote uh, made by Ford. And it's an excellent motor. It's 460 horsepower, it's fuel injected, and it'll drop right into your build. Um, and if I could go back in time, you know, I would I would seriously consider doing this rather than you know the path I took. I love my car the way it is, don't get me wrong, um, but there's so many pros with this engine. Uh, you know, it's fuel injected, it'll start in the cold, uh, it's gonna have a warranty, and well, I mean, let's be honest, this thing will probably outlast your, your car. And what I mean here is if you change your oil regularly and you don't like beat on it, you know, wind it up to seven grand every other stoplight, it'll probably easily go 150, 200,000 miles without missing a beat. So right now on Summit, uh, a new Coyote motor goes for about 10 grand. Uh, however, the same engine has been used in Mustangs for at least the past 10 years, and you can find these at salvage yards. There's lots of them out there, and a lot of them are low miles. So I, I did a quick search, and I was able to find two 2019 5-liter uh, Coyote engines going for between five and six thousand dollars. So one other thing I'll say about crate motors here um, is it doesn't have to be a Coyote, right? LS, that's a great motor. I mean, some people might think that's kind of sacrilegious putting the Chevy motor in the, the Shelby. Uh, it's a kick car. If you want an LS, I, I wouldn't hesitate. If you like those motors, put one in there. Um, the old school Windsors, you can get those in crate motor form, just like, you know, the one I put in mine. And that's ex also, a, you know, an excellent choice. And, and the nice thing about buying any crate motor for that matter is it's going to save you a ton of time. And looking back at my build, you know, I estimate I spent at least 50% of my time uh, on engine work. All right, so this is a nice segue to the second path you can take with engine selection for your build. Um, so this is the path I took. And that's to find a Ford small block Windsor at a junkyard and rebuild it. So why would you want to rebuild a Ford small block Windsor for this car? All right, so let me tell you my opinion why you should consider it. So first off, uh, these motors are cheap. Uh, there's tons of them around. You can find them at salvage yards. You know, Ford pumped these things out for like 30, 40 years. 
Um, so mine, I paid, I think right around 200 bucks. I, I remember they didn't even charge me a core charge because they, you know, they had so many of them. And what you're buying when you pick one of these up at the salvage yard is really three things. Uh, the first is the cylinder heads. Uh, the second is the core, which is, you know, the engine block. And the third is the rotating assembly. So that's the crankshaft and the pistons. Basically everything else that comes on that salvage yard engine, you're probably not going to use. So these three things together make up a long block assembly. Um, so your salvage yard long block assembly, you're going to be reconditioning it, and I'll walk you through what I did. And then once it's been reconditioned, you're going to add all the accessories, you know, to hot rod it out. So that's the performance cam, it's the intake, it's the distributor, the exhaust manifolds, etc. The second reason I'll give you to consider a small block uh, Ford Windsor from the salvage yard uh, is the engine itself is very well suited in terms of size and performance uh, to the Cobra's uh, performance needs. First, you're going to have a smaller engine package than a Coyote. I love the Coyote, but it definitely is a big motor, so going with the Windsor, you're going to have some more room under the hood. And second, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you more than enough power. I'll just say it again, I, I mean 300 horsepower. Once you start inching above that in this car, it, it's, it's both unsafe and you just don't need it. You, you don't need it. Ask yourself, you know, are you trying to build a car that's going to draw crowds at the car show because it's a car show specimen? Or are you trying to build, uh, you know, a car that's well suited for the street? Okay, if you decide you want to take path number two and rebuild a salvage yard motor, uh, let me walk you through what I did. And I want to set this up by saying uh, I built this motor in a very budget conscious manner, which means I didn't necessarily do it by the book. I was most focused on just getting the car out on the road so I could work out some of the bugs, you know, get it licensed. And long term, I'd always planned to rebuild another engine. And uh, actually, that's what I'm doing right now. So the first thing you want to do when you get your salvage yard motor home is to disassemble it and clean everything. And the reason you want to do that is so you can see any issues you might have with the engine. Uh, obvious cracks, uh, bearing wear, you know, there's any number of things that can go wrong with an engine. And if it's dirty, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell, you know, what kind of problem you might have. My degreaser of choice is Purple Power. So the reason I like this stuff is it's cheap. Uh, you can get it at Walmart for eight or 10 bucks a gallon and it works really well. So usually I just soak the parts uh, anywhere from an hour. Sometimes I'll leave them overnight. And just some nylon brushes and a rinse usually gets most of the gunk and gram off. When it comes to rust removal, a uh, wire wheel on an angle grinder is something I've done a lot of over the years. And it works good, you know, and there's a lot of effort that goes into that. However, with the engine I'm building right now, I decided to try using electrolysis to remove rust from the engine block. And starting to paraphrase here, I'm super happy with the results. So basically, uh, rust is iron oxide. You know, it's oxygen bonded to an iron atom. And basically the application of current through an electrolyte, which is what you make out of water and washing soda, breaks the chemical bonds between the iron and the oxygen. And then that excess iron just falls away. It sinks to the bottom of uh, your tank. And these results, they speak for themselves. So I'm super pumped with how well this worked. And I'll definitely be using this again in the future. Now with your engine disassembled and clean, uh, next you want to start measuring the key components uh, that you're going to be using, which again, it's the rotating assembly. And what you want to measure are the crankshaft journals to see if they're in spec. You want to also check the rods and see if those are in spec too if you plan to reuse them. And then the cylinder bores. You want to try and see if those are straight or not straight. Now in the event you find some of these components are out of spec, like the crankshaft, uh, it's out around, or the cylinder bores, they're not straight. Um, the the by-the-book way to fix this is to both bore the engine block oversized and then regrind the crankshaft. However, if you do a budget build like I did, uh, there's some things you can do, which technically they're not as good as you know remachining these engine uh, components, but they're going to get you a reasonably reliable final assembly. Granted, you're checking the right things. All right, so let me give you an example. So the cylinders on my engine, uh, they were straight and they were within spec uh, of the piston clearance requirements, which was great. Uh, but the cylinder walls were very shiny. So over the life of the engine, that reciprocating motion, it basically polishes those surfaces to a shine. And the reason you don't want that is you want oil to be able to grab on to the surface of the cylinder and help lubricate that piston as it goes up and down. So what you use is you use a bottle hone 
or a, a glaze breaker to basically add scratches to the cylinder wall to help retain oil. So when you do this, you also need to replace the piston rings at the same time. Now when you read online, uh, Molly rings are like a, a buzzword, right? Everyone use Molly, the superior, you know, you get superior performance, blah, 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 leak down's great. Um, but those Molly rings, they definitely are harder to seat. And if you don't seat those correctly, what I mean seat here is they have to wear to the cylinder wall. And if you don't bore the engine, and there's a high risk they might not seat well, and then you got bad compression and your engine basically sucks. So in place of these, I used cast iron rings, which are definitely not as good as Molly rings. They're gonna wear much faster, but the benefit here is they're gonna wear to the imperfect cylinder wall that's already there. And they might not last 120,000 miles, but if they last 50,000 miles with good compression, you know, it's a win in my book. So also note, um, I was not building a high performance motor. So if you're building high horsepower motors, you definitely want a superior piston ring uh, going around your pistons. But again, what are you what are you trying to build here? Are you trying to build a uh, you know, quarter mile rocket or are you just trying to build an engine for the street? All right, so my crankshaft was in spec. Um, I just replaced the bearings, but similar to the piston ring, something you can do here is, is say that crankshaft journal is undersized, it's worn too much. You can actually buy oversized bearings that have an extra thou or two of material on them uh, to bring it back into spec. Now again, would you do this on a race engine? Uh, the answer is probably no, you'd regrind that crankshaft. But for a budget build, you know, it's something to consider. Something else to keep in mind too is say you open that engine up and you find a broken piston and you gotta replace it. Or you have a rod that's way out of spec and you gotta replace that. Uh, you can't change those components without rebalancing the rotating assembly. So the crankshaft and the pistons and the rods all together from the factory are balanced within about two grams of one another. And if you change masses without rebalancing, the engine's gonna shake and it's not gonna last long. So don't skimp here. If you change components, make sure you have it rebalanced. So when it comes to cylinder heads, if you buy a late model 5.0, uh, most of those came with GT40 heads, and these are a really good set of cylinder heads. And late model, it's gonna be any late 90s uh, Explorer, F-150 truck. Uh, the late 80s, early 90s Mustangs had them too. Uh, and these heads flow very well. Now the performance of these cylinder heads, you know, they're not gonna equal like an aftermarket aluminum cylinder head that you might find on Summit or Jags, but they get pretty close in terms of like flow numbers if you're willing to put a little work into them like I did. So I cleaned up the heads, you know, just like the engine, you gotta clean them so you can see what you're working with. And the exhaust valves were very pitted, so they needed to be replaced. And at the same time, for good measure, I just replaced the intake valves too. And the reason I did that is, you know, that pitting, it's going to interfere with the valve closing and seating well um, during the combustion cycle. And if they don't seat well, uh, you know, you're not going to have good compression. And if you don't have good compression, you know, the engine performance is going to suffer. Now, the new valves, they're not going to just seat well right out of the box either. So you have to sort of mate them together. So just like I was talking about the, the piston rings need to wear to the cylinder walls, you want these valves to also match the valve seat. And that's where Typically you do a three angle valve job and that's where you regrind the valve seat. So to save a couple bucks, what I did is I just lapped the valves to the existing valve seats. And what lapping is, is you just apply a lapping media, which is think of it as like a wet, gritty, pasty sandpaper, like it's a sandpaper paste. And then you sand that valve, you rotate it uh, against the existing valve seat until they wear together. And then to check it, you reassemble the cylinder head and then fill the combustion chambers with paint thinner and just let it sit for a while. And what you're, why, the reason you're doing this is you're, you want to see if that paint thinner can sneak by the exhaust seat or the intake seat into the ports. And then you know you need to lap it some more. I added a spring set made by TrickFlow to these heads too um, that utilize a low profile retainer. And the reason I did that is you get a little bit more lift. So if you want to go with a higher lift cam, uh, this will buy you the clearance you need with the existing setup on the head. I could spend hours walking you through all the different things I did to this engine to make sure it ran right the first time I turned the key. And the reason I'm telling you that is if you decide to go this route and rebuild an engine, uh, you know, this video isn't going to tell you everything. You're going to want to read more on the forums about how to rebuild an engine or maybe get a book on how to rebuild engines, right? Uh, but don't be afraid to give it a try. Uh, and I say that because once you understand how the internal combustion engine works, uh, it becomes very clear on how you should then be rebuilding it and what to watch out for. So at the end of the day, uh, the 5.0 I built for this car uh, has definitely exceeded my expectations in both performance and reliability. 
So even a wimpy 300 horsepower that this thing puts out makes the car a complete rocket. You know, it's got the original pistons that have wound it well over 6,000 RPM more than a few times. Uh, it doesn't burn any oil, it starts right up. You know, it is a solid motor. So even though I'm replacing it, uh, as a package, I'm not going to take it apart again. I mean, I will definitely, when I pull this, it's going to go on another project at some point. Okay, well that's all I got for today, so why don't you leave me a comment, let me know what you think, and thanks for watching.